we are continuing our reading of J. H. Murrow Daubigny's History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, and now Chapter Two, which deals with grace, dead faith, works, unity and duality, Pelagianism, salvation at the hands of priests, penances, flagellations, indulgences, works of supererogation, purgatory, taxation, jubilee, the papacy and Christianity, state of Christendom. But along with the principle which should rule the history of Christianity was one which should rule its doctrine. The grand idea of Christianity was the idea of grace, pardon, amnesty, and the gift of eternal life. This idea supposed in man an estrangement from God and an impossibility on his part to re-enter into communion was a being of infinite holiness. The opposition between true and false doctrine cannot, it is true, be entirely summed up in the question of salvation by faith and salvation by works. Still, it is its most prominent feature. Or rather, salvation considered as coming from man is the creating principle of all error and all abuse. The excesses produced by this fundamental error led to the Reformation, and the profession of a contrary principle achieved it. This feature must stand prominently out in an introduction to the history of the Reformation. Salvation by grace, then, is the second characteristic which essentially distinguished the religion of God from all human religions. What had become of it? Had the Church kept this great and primordial idea as a precious deposit? Let us follow its history. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, Asia, Greece, and Rome, in the days of the first emperors, heard the glad tidings. By grace are ye saved, through faith. It is the gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8. At this voice of peace, at this gospel, at this powerful word, many guilty souls believing were brought near to him who is the source of peace, and numerous Christian churches were formed in the midst of the corrupt generation then existing. But a great misapprehension soon arose as to the nature of saving faith. Faith, according to St. Paul, is the means by which the whole being of the believer, his intellect, his heart, and his will, enter into possession of the salvation which the incarnation of the Son of God has purchased for him. Jesus Christ is apprehended by faith, and thenceforth becomes everything for man and in man. He imparts a divine life to human nature, and man thus renewed, disengaged from the power of selfishness and sin, has new affections and does new works. Faith, says theology, in order to express these ideas, is the subjective appropriation of the objective work of Christ. If faith is not an appropriation of salvation, it is nothing. The whole Christian economy is disturbed. The sources of new life are sealed up, and Christianity is overturned at its base. Such was the actual result the practical view being gradually forgotten. Faith soon became nothing more than what it still is to many, an act of the understanding, a simple submission to superior authority. This first error necessarily led to a second. Faith being stripped of its practical character could not possibly be said to save alone works no longer coming after it, behoved to be placed beside it, and the doctrine that man is justified by faith and by works 
gained a footing in the church. To the Christian unity, which includes under the same principle justification and works, grace and law, doctrine and duty, succeeded the sad duality, which makes religion and morality to be quite distinct, a fatal error, which separates things that cannot live unless united, and which, putting the soul on one side and the body on the other, causes death. The words of the Apostle, echoing through all ages, are, Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3, verse 3 Another great error arose to disturb the doctrine of grace. This was Pelagianism. Pelagius maintained that human nature is not fallen, that there is no hereditary corruption, and that man, having received the power of doing good, has only to will it in order to perform it. If goodness consists in certain external actions, Pelagius is right. But if we look to the motives from which those external actions proceed, we find in every part of man selfishness, forgetfulness of God, pollution, and powerlessness. The Pelagian doctrine, driven back from the church by Augustine, when it advanced to his open front, soon presented a side view in the shape of semi-Pelagianism, and under the mask of Augustinian formulae. This heresy spread over Christendom with astonishing rapidity. The danger of the system appeared, above all, in this, by placing goodness not within, but was out, it caused a great value to be set on external works, on legal observances, and acts of penance. The more of these men did, the holier they were. They won heaven by them, and individuals were soon seen, a very astonishing circumstance, certainly, who went farther in holiness than was required. Pelagianism, at the same time it corrupted doctrine, strengthened the hierarchy, was the same hand with which it lowered grace, it elevated the church, for grace is of God, and the church is of man. The deeper our conviction that the whole world is guilty before God, the more will we cleave to Jesus Christ as the only source of grace. With such a view, how can we place the church on a level with him? since she has nothing but the whole body of persons, subject to the same natural misery, but so soon as we attribute to man a holiness of his own, all is changed, and ecclesiastics and monks become the most natural medium of receiving the grace of God. This was what happened after Pelagius. Salvation, taken out of the hands of God, fell into the hands of priests, who put themselves in the Lord's place. Souls, thirsting for pardon, behoved no longer to look towards heaven, but towards the church, and above all, towards its pretended head. To blinded minds, the pontiff of Rome was instead of God. Hence the greatness of the popes and indescribable abuses. The evil went farther still. Pelagianism, in maintaining that man may attain perfect sanctification, pretended likewise that the merits of saints and martyrs might be applied to the church. A particular virtue was even ascribed to their intercession. They were addressed in prayer, their aid was invoked in all the trials of life, and a real idolatry supplanted the adoration of the true and living God. Pelagianism, at the same time, multiplied rites and ceremonies. Man imagining that he could, and that he ought by good works to render himself worthy of grace, 
saw nothing better fitted to merit it than outward worship. The law of ceremonies becoming endlessly complicated was soon held equal at least to the moral law, and thus the conscience of Christians was burdened anew, was a yoke which had been declared intolerable in the times of the apostles. Acts 15 verse 10 But what most of all deformed Christianity was the system of penance which rose out of Pelagianism. Penance at first consisted in certain public signs of repentance, which the church required of those whom she had excluded for scandal, and who were desirous of being again received into her bosom. By degrees, penance was extended to all sins, even the most secret, and was considered as a kind of chastisement to which it was necessary to submit in order to acquire the pardon of God through the absolution of priests. Ecclesiastical penance was thus confounded with Christian repentance, without which there cannot be either justification or sanctification. Instead of expecting pardon from Christ only by faith, it was expected chiefly from the Church by works of penance. Great importance was attached to the outward marks of repentance, tears, fastings, and macerations. While the internal renewal of the heart, which alone constitutes true conversion, was forgotten. As confession and works of penance are easier than the extirpation of sin and the abandonment of vice, many ceased to struggle against the lusts of the flesh, deeming it better to supply their place by means of certain macerations. Works of penance substituted in lieu of the salvation of God kept multiplying in the church from the days of Tertullian in the third century. The thing now deemed necessary was to fast, go barefoot, and wear no linen, etc., or to quit house and home for distant lands, or, better still, to renounce the world and embrace the monastic state. To all this were added, in the eleventh century, voluntary flagellations. These, at a later period, became a real mania in Italy, which at that time was violently agitated. Nobles and peasants, young and old, even children of five, go two and two by hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands through villages, towns, and cities, with an apron tied round their waist, their only clothing, and visit the churches in procession in the dead of winter. Armed with a whip, they flagellate themselves without mercy, and the streets resound with cries, and groans, such as to force tears from those who hear them. Still long before the evil had reached this height, men felt the oppression of the priests, and sighed for deliverance. The priests themselves had perceived that if they did not apply a remedy, their usurped power would be lost, and therefore they invented the system of barter, so well known under the name of indulgences. What they said was this, You penitents are not able to fulfill the tasks which are enjoined you? Well then, we priests of God and your pastors will take the heavy burden on ourselves for a fast of seven weeks. Says Regino, abbot of Prum, there will be paid by a rich man twenty pence, by one less so ten pence, by the poor three pence, and so in like proportion for other things. Bold voices were raised against this traffic, but in vain. The Pope soon discovered the advantages which he might draw from these indulgences. In the thirteenth century, Alexander Hales, 
the irrefragable doctor, invented a doctrine well fitted to secure this vast resource to the papacy. And a bull of Clement the Seventh declared it an article of faith. Jesus Christ, it was said, did far more than was necessary to reconcile God to man, for that a single drop of his blood would have sufficed. But he shed much blood in order to found a treasury for his church, a treasury which even eternity should not be able to exhaust. The supererogatory merits of the saints, that is, the value of the works which they did beyond their obligation, served also to augment this treasury, the custody and administration of which have been entrusted to Christ's vicar upon earth, who applies to each sinner for the faults committed after baptism these merits of Jesus Christ and the saints according to the measure and quantity which his sins render necessary. Who will venture to attack a practice whose origin is so holy? This inconceivable traffic soon extends and becomes more complex. The philosophers of Alexandria speak of a fire in which souls are to be made pure. This philosophical opinion, which several ancient doctors had adopted, Rome declared to be a doctrine of the Church. The Pope, by a bull, annexed purgatory to his domain. He decreed that man should there expiate what he might not be able to expiate here below, but that indulgences could deliver souls from their intermediate state in which their sins must otherwise detain them. This dogma is expounded by Thomas Aquinas in his famous theological summa. Nothing was spared to fill the mind with terror. The torments which the purifying fire inflicts on those who become its victims were painted in dreadful colors. Even at the present day, in many Catholic countries, we see pictures exhibited in churches or in the public streets in which poor souls in the midst of burning flames are calling in agony for relief. Who could refuse the redemption money, which on falling into the treasury of Rome was to ransom the soul from such sufferings? In order to give regularity to this traffic, there was shortly after drawn up, probably by John the Twenty-Second, the famous and scandalous taxation of indulgences of which there have been more than forty editions. Ears the least delicate would be offended were we to repeat all the horrible things contained in it. Incest will cost, if it is not known, five groschen. If known, six. So much will be paid for murder, so much for infanticide, adultery, perjury, housebreaking, etc. Shame upon Rome, exclaims Claudius Esperse, a Roman theologian, and we add, shame upon human nature, for we cannot reproach Rome with anything which does not recoil upon man himself. Rome is humanity magnified in some of its evil propensities. We say this for the sake of truth, and we also say it for the sake of justice. Boniface the Eighth, the boldest and most ambitious of the popes after Gregory the Seventh, outstripped all his predecessors. In the year 1300 he published a bull, by which he announced to the church that every hundred years all persons repairing to Rome would there obtain a plenary indulgence. Crowds flocked from Italy, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, France, Spain, Germany, Hungary, and all quarters. Old men of sixty and seventy set out. And there was counted at Rome in one month to the number of two hundred thousand pilgrims. 
all these strangers bringing rich offerings, the Pope and the Romans saw their treasury filled. Roman avarice soon fixed each jubilee at fifty years, next at thirty-three, and at last at twenty-five. Then, for the greater convenience of buyers, and the greater profit of sellers, the jubilee and its indulgences were transported from Rome to all parts of Christendom. There was no occasion to leave home. What others had gone to seek beyond the Alps, each might purchase at his own door. The evil could not go farther. Then the reformers arose. We formerly saw what became of the principle which should rule the history of Christianity, and we have now seen what became of that which should rule its doctrine. Both were lost. To establish a mediating caste between God and man, and insist that the salvation which God gives shall be purchased by works, penances, and money, is the papacy. To give all by Jesus Christ was out a human mediator, and was out that power which is called the Church. Free access to the great gift of eternal life which God bestows on man is Christianity and the Reformation. The papacy is an immense wall raised between man and God by the labor of ages. Whosoever would pass it must lay his account was paying or suffering. And yet will it not be passed? The Reformation is the power which threw down this wall, restored Christ to man, and leveled the path by which he may come to his Creator. The papacy interposes the church between God and man. Christianity and the Reformation make them meet face to face. The papacy separates, the gospel unites them. Having thus traced the history of the decay and extinction of the two great principles which distinguish the religion of God from all the religions of man, let us attend to some of the results of this vast alteration. First, however, let us pay some tribute of respect to this church of the Middle Ages, which succeeded that of the Apostles and Fathers, and preceded that of the Reformers. The Church, although decayed, and always more and more enslaved, still was the Church, that is to say, still remained the most powerful friend that man possessed. Her hands, though tied, could still bless. During those ages, great servants of Jesus Christ, men who in essential doctrines were true Protestants, shed a benign light, and in the most humble convent or the most obscure parish were found poor monks and poor priests to solace deep griefs. The Catholic Church was not the papacy. The latter acted the part of oppressor, the former that of the oppressed. The Reformation which declared war on the one came to deliver the other. And yet, truce to tell, the papacy itself was sometimes in the hands of God, who brings good out of evil, a necessary counterpoise to the power and ambition of princes. This concludes chapter 2.